Florida User Group. My name is Adriano, your host, and uh, today we are privileged with the presence of Christina Mishra here with us. Hello, Christina. Hello, how are you? Well, thank you, and thanks for being here with us. Thank you. All right, so Christina will be presenting on getting started with artificial intelligence and computer vision. So can you tell, uh, before we get started here, can you tell us where are you located at? I'm in Ames, Iowa currently. So I moved here from Atlanta about three years ago. All right. And uh, also, folks, if you're out there, let us know where are you located at. Use the live chat, enter your location as we are live. So any questions you have during the presentation, just type it into live chat. I'll be monitoring and relaying any questions here to Christina. Now, if the presentation has completed and you have questions after the live stream, just enter in the comment section below and uh, I will relate to Christina. All right, folks. And uh, back to you here, Christina. So tell us a little bit about yourself. So I just finished, recently finished my master's and I took some additional time off to celebrate and relax with my family after the last complicated two years. Uh, my last title was data architect, though so that switched sometimes based on the project. Um, so it's just always, I've always had a data related um, title for the last 20 years. So for now, I've just been doing some consulting for specific projects that companies have reached out to me for. All right, so, and you have your contact information in your upcoming slides as well, right? Yes, absolutely. All right, great. So, folks, keep an eye out. So, also, tell us a little bit about your presentation. Sure. So, this presentation is just kind of a higher level AI um, computer vision presentation for beginners. Uh, it gives an overview of some key concepts and a walkthrough of obstacles encountered from my first projects and some insights on how to make it uh, a person's first project if they if they so in, entailed to, to jump into this venue, um, how to make theirs more successful and a little bit less painful. All right, sounds quite interesting. So without further ado, folks, Let's get started with getting started with AI and computer vision by Christina Mishra. Thank you, Christina. It's all you. you. All right. So hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining my session today, getting started with AI and computer vision, a guide of obstacles and insights from the field. My name is Christina Mishra, a quick background about me. I've been a data professional for over 20 years. I've held titles such as data architect, DBA, consultant, developer, manager, coach, and many more. So some of my favorite projects have been working with the CDC, working for CSC for the World Trade Center Health Project, and several global health PEPFAR projects. I was a volunteer organizer for SQL Saturday in Atlanta for over eight years and for the induction year for SQL Saturday BI in Atlanta. Recently, I went back to school to get my master's in business analytics, studying both the leadership and technical sides of data analytics, and following that, decided I wanted to start getting some certifications under my belt. To start off with a little background on how a 20 plus year SQL Server data professional ended up doing computer vision. Recently, I decided to go back to school and get my master's degree. I always wanted to go back to school and convince myself it was perfect time. Um, never mind COVID-19 would hit shortly afterwards and I would be doing my degrees while also teaching my young twins for 18 months. After taking a course from the industrial engineering department, I saw a course titled Advanced Analytics Projects. This class was for a few graduate students to work directly with a company on an analytics project. There were three of us and we had our choice of projects. The options available was something along the lines of predict performance of an item over multiple years, design a method to suggest optimal locations, and a computer vision project. 
identify and estimate the percentage of similar objects within an image. I had zero experience with computer vision and honestly had to Google it. It sounded really cool. Never having let a thing like experience stand in my way. As a data professional, I've often been tasked with, hey, can you learn this new thing really fast and implement it? So of course my vote went to the computer vision project. Turns out, so did the other two students. It was unanimous. And these were super smart industrial engineering grad students. So surely we would be fine. What could go wrong? Turns out none of us had experience in computer vision and our collective experience in Python at the time wasn't much better. Somehow we did it. We, had all, we all had to work like mad, but we did it and we learned a lot along the way. So much that I decided to frame my capstone project along similar lines because I could take it to the new directions and explore things further than we were initially able to do. Again, what could go wrong? And that brings us to this presentation. So this session goes through some of the major things that did go wrong. And hopefully you will have a takeaway from this session that helps you avoid or alleviate some of the pain points that I went through should you decide to embark upon a computer vision project in the future. Before we get into what went wrong, we need to back up for just a moment and explain some broader terms. First, let's talk about what is AI. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is a term we hear all the time in news stories and often in data discussions, but it isn't always clear. AI is a term used to describe a machine capable of solving a specific problem. The machine solves the problem by some sort of intelligence from simple problems that may be solved by intelligence if then logic, or much more complex scenarios like determining if people are wearing masks in a live stream feed. It encapsulates all these other items you see in the diagram. Moving down from AI, we see that machine learning is a subset. Machine learning is a particular type of AI where the machine learns by itself. And the machine uses data to improve performance in learning. It's one of those fun terms in IT where the name is pretty descriptive, teaching a machine to learn. Moving on to neural networks, this is a system that mimics the human brain. Things go in, you learn, you learn from your learning. This may be repeated many times over and you give an output. A simple neural network may have three layers, an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. It also has something called weights that connect everything and facilitate in learning. It's got some math to it, but really that's the gist. Then we have deep learning. The deep and deep learning is referring to the depth of layers in a neural network. The how many times you are learning from the learning. A deep learning neural network will have more than one hidden layer. So it really has the capacity to learn more and to learn from its own mistakes. Think of it like a toddler that touches a plug and gets a small shock. The toddler's probably gonna conclude that plugs are bad versus an adult that may have a much deeper understanding of electricity. The adult has learned a lot more along the way. So what is computer vision? Computer vision is largely a subset of artificial intelligence, and it gives a system the ability to potentially acquire, see, understand, and analyze image type input. Part of computer vision falls outside the AI group, as it can also involve some things that you wouldn't traditionally put under AI, like image manipulation. I take a bunch of images and I change them to grayscale, it's not really AI, but it may be an important part of a process for an image data set I'm using in my computer vision project. So here are just a few different types of computer vision tasks. In the first picture, you see that every single pixel has been assigned to a category, green for grass, yellow for cat, pink for tree, and blue for sky. This is called semantic segmentation. If I had three cats in this image, they would all be yellow. And that's why the trees you see here are pink. The second image is two things. It identifies the object and classify it, classifies it. So maybe in this instance, it would tell you that for this object, I put it at a cat is a 90% chance, a fox at 5%, a 
a squirrel at 3% and a dog at 2%, something like that. In the third image, there are multiple objects. So kind of the same thing as the second image, but having to identify multiple things and sometimes multiple objects of the same thing, like the two dogs here. In the last image, you are identifying exactly where the object is and putting a mask on it to identify each pixel in the mask. Some similarities as the semantic segmentation, I could have also labeled the entire image like you see in picture one. The difference is that each object is its own thing, even if the category is the same. There are other tasks, but this gives us a good starting point. A project may just use one of these or multiple if it was comparing to see which is better. In my project, I use semantic segmentation, but I could have used instant segmentation and that would have made for, you know, kind of an interesting comparison. Some key terms. I'm gonna front load you here with a bunch of key terms that were used in my computer vision projects and will be relevant in just a bit. So bear with me, I know it's a lot. Key term one is in the center here and we will refer to this as annotation. It's about manually identifying each object in an image and labeling it accordingly. The image you see here was annotated with an open source product that lets you manually draw edges around each object and then label it. Later on, I'll show you a quick, super quick demo on it. In this image, you will see roughly that 17 objects were identified and labeled. Um, then depending on how you made those annotations, you can create outputs that a computer vision system can use to understand an image's content. Key term two is called ground truth. A ground truth image is often an output of the annotation process. In the context of a ground truth image, it is used as a mirror image to the original to let a system know what is what. That labeling you did in the annotation process now becomes its own image. Imagine a system going pixel by pixel between an original image and a ground truth image and learning by comparisons. Pixel one in this image looks like this. Pixel one in the ground truth is black, which means background. Got it. Move to pixel two. While this would be an incredibly slow process for a person, obviously a computer can do it faster and starts to learn the different subtleties of each pixel. I'm using pixels here as an example, but there are other ways to do it as well. Key term three is a much simpler concept and frankly, it's not always used, but it's a really good thing to know. And that is a contour. A contour is simply drawing the edges around an object. It's the contour of the object. You can get this information multiple ways. And later this week, um, I'll upload an example on how to do, um, how to build a contour image like this from JSON annotation outputs into my GitHub. So if you're interested, I'll provide the link to that at the end of this presentation. Contours are common in computer vision, but you won't always have to produce an image like what you see here. When you do, it can sometimes be kind of tricky to produce it. So knowing the concept and the term is really helpful. Splitting a data set is another important concept in machine learning and really in a lot of different statistical applications. The basis of it is that you want to keep a different set to train on, to test on, and to validate against. By doing this, you keep each set independent. That way too, you aren't giving cheat sheets to the model. You start with one set of images, and then you typically split them into three sets, training, validation, and testing. Some people only do two, and there are other methods as well, but knowing what we are talking about here will help you as you run into those other scenarios. Your training set is usually your largest set. This is what your model trains on. Your validation set is used to see how well your training set learned and then you can tweak some parameters to see if it helps that learning process. You want to make sure you don't overfit the model though. What that basically means is that you want your model to be able to generalize and not just fit data exactly to the information you have given it. So what do I mean by generalize? For example, if I want my system to learn what a dog is and I give it pictures of St. Bernard's Rottweilers and Mastiffs, if I tune my model too much to those dogs, 
then it may miss the adorable miniature pincher I give it in the final testing phase. That's basically the concept of overfitting, only knowing the big dogs. Generalize is being able to take the information from the big dogs and abstract it to the dogs that may look different. Your last set, test set, is the most important one. This is the pictures you have kept completely separate, which you should have done for all the sets. After testing with your training set against your validation set, you want that third set that has not seen the light of day so you know how good it really is. Maybe your model was tuned too well, where it really worked well for your validation set, those big dogs, but not for any other set in the world. That final testing set will generally bear this information out. The test set gives an unbiased estimate of the skill of the final tune model. Along those same lines, you typically will split your train test validate sets in percentages. You want the bulk of your data to be part of your training set, so it's given a higher percentage than the other sets. And then the remaining data go to your validation and test sets. Here are some typical splits of sets. Now, it doesn't have to be exact, and there are some pragmatic ways you can do it, but these splits are pretty common. For an 80-10-10 split, that means 80% of your images would go to the training set, 10% to the validation, and 10% to test. You could also do numbers such as 75, 15, 10, with the idea that you're trying to end up with 100%. In a lot of cases in computer vision, unless you just have gobs of images, 60% is not going to be enough to train. Conversely, if you're working with a smaller data set and you don't have the option to get more, then you should consider leaning towards the 80% split. You have to play around with it a bit. Ultimately, if you don't have enough images, you are just not going to get great results. And unfortunately, there is no magic number. It really depends on what your model is trying to do. Last key terms before we jump into the fun. When I did my first computer vision project, I remembered the concept of an image having what is called channels. I remembered at a very basic level, the concept of channels with RGB or black and white, but not really beyond that. In computer vision terms, an image is an array that has at least width and height dimension, but often has at least one more dimension such as RGB color. I'm going to use the example of RGB channels here, but no, you're not just limited to that option. An image can have multiple channels that can mean different things. If we had a 5x5 five five RGB color image, then the shape of this image would be 553. Five, five, In this example, the 3 represents color dimension that gives a numeric value for red, for green, and one for blue for the size of the width and the height. So here, our five by five image has a three by three square inside it with a red value of 255, a green value of five, and a blue value of 100. The square at the bottom you see here is a smaller scale of what this would look like as an image. The zeros you see at the top for all the channels, when combined, equals the color black. And 255 for red, five for green, and 100 for blue equals a fuchsia type color the square in the middle. There are other types of channels you can use, but this, but this gives you the general idea. The WHC you see below the 553 shape stands for width, height, and color. Channels is a really important topic in computer vision that could be its own presentation. So if you are interested in computer vision, take some time to explore the different ways that channels can be used. My project, what was it? Why did I want to do it? What we will be walking through here is a project that I've done a couple of times in different variations. Here, I will be talking about my capstone project because then I don't have to worry about the non-disclosures and really because that was the project where I had a lot of gotchas that I feel can be most helpful to others. First, what was it? The official title was Computer Vision and Using Edge Detection as a Fourth Channel. What does it mean by fourth channel? Going back to where we previously talked about that three channel representing a shape of 553, five, and now we're going to add that contour image we talked about, which has a shape of 55, five, also known as 551. Five, 
with the numbers being zero or one to represent an edge. So we're going to concatenate that contour image with the original image, which in our example would now result in a shape of five, five, four. So why did I want to do it? To see if adding the contour would improve results for identifying blood cells, particularly with overlapping blood cells. Overlapping objects that have similarities is an ongoing problem in computer vision that does not have a civil, silver bullet solution yet. Um, by using blood cells, the ideas, code, and learning models could be used in other industries. And a second part of the project was to be able to accomplish the various steps with low cost solutions so that stakeholders and global health worldwide and other industries may be able to use part or whole of the project without running into significant costs. So here I'll pause uh, and, and check with you, Adrino. It, it, are there any questions that I need to, to answer? No, the, been... there are no questions here at this point. Okay, so we'll, go, we'll continue on then. So given I had a hard deadline for my project, I needed to determine the steps I could take and then decide which were required, which were nice, and which brought value given the expected effort. Note, I had done a similar project before with a small team for a client, so I wasn't going in completely blind. That brought me to this three-stage process. I personally like to divide them into three categories, data, model, results. Notice the double-sided arrow at the bottom that really signifies that these items aren't done linearly. Obviously, you couldn't start with results, but after getting results or even while running your models, you may have to jump back to the data stage and revisit things, which has happened to me many, many times. I can't even imagine a project starting from scratch where you wouldn't jump back to previous stages potentially many times. The first step was acquiring the data. You can't really do anything until that is in place. The primary data set I used is a subset of the microscopic peripheral blood cell images made publicly available through the collaboration of the Clinic Hospital of Barcelona, the Technical University of Catalonia, and the University del Rosero Bogada. The set has over 17,000 images in it. I used much less. Images were obtained at the core laboratory at the Hospital Clinic of Barcelona and consisted of red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. The images were annotated by expert clinical pathologists and organized into eight groups. The class IDs two through nine in this table are the classes that were identified in the original data set. The other classes, background, RBC, and RBCOL are ones I added because my project wasn't trying to identify a singular cell within an image, but rather all the objects within an image. The majority of images were sized at 360 width by 363 height. The description file stated all of the images were of this size, but I later found out there was a small number that was a different size. So before we even get into problem number one, I'll say first do some verification steps on your data. Don't automatically go by what the documentation says or even what anyone else says. You definitely want to verify something as crucial in computer vision as size because a lot of times you are going to need your images to all be of the same size. The original information with the data set stated that the data was annotated. My experience with annotated images came from the open source project VGG Image Annotator, VIN, which you see here. It's a simple program that opens up in your favorite web browser and you don't have to install anything. You see the outside lines of each object, which is referred to as polygon. So um, I'm gonna flip here to the actual program. And again, it's just open up an edge. Um, so what do you do? You'd select polygon here kind of draw your contours around. I'm not gonna do a careful job since this is just a presentation and not real life. Let's select that. I never seem to 
get this, I'm going to move this around just a bit. There we go. Then you'd select which category you wanted this to be. This is a RBC, just a plain one. It's not an overlapping one. It's not one on the edge. So I would classify it as a RBC. And you do that for each object, right? And then ultimately at the end, you could export all these annotations you've done, which is really just X and Y points that I clicked all around. These here that you see have a ton. The one I just did only as a couple, but um, I wasn't trying to make it precise. So you you can export as the from this program, these, these exports that you see here. Um, and what that really kind of equals out to is something like this. This is a JSON export of this image. Um, what you see, again, each object here is going to show you like this. These are kind of uh, shrunk down. But if I open them up, you're going to see all these X points and see how many there are in one, just one object. And then all the Y, the corresponding Y um, points. And, and that's the the, what you're exporting in that JSON file so that you can then feed that to different things that may need it downstream. All right, so this is pretty much what my idea of what annotation was. You can import or export those XY coordinates to, to any of the ones that we showed. And you know that's that's what we did. Sometimes you can do it with other programs with XML. Um, so that's kind of what I expected with the annotations uh, included with my data set. So I expected some sort of file that I could pull into VIA, maybe have to tweak a bit, and then poof, all my little polygons would appear, and I could export my required VIA J JSON file. I actually needed that specific JSON format that we just saw um, for my downstream process that created those contour images we discussed earlier. This is what I got. This is what they called annotations, a directory structure where each image was placed in one of eight folders that was determined by the largest dyed cell in the image. For example, this folder contains all the images where the base of fills were front and center. No identifying file that told me the X and Y points defining the polygon of the base of fill or anything else in the image, nothing. So I had to go back and start annotating each object by hand. I think my first 10 images took me about 45 minutes for each image. Clearly that was not gonna work. And my 17,000 image data set was probably not gonna be that big if that was my rate per image. I then got to delve into the wonderful world of annotation software looking for faster solutions. I had a second problem, and that was I needed to be able to create ground truth images. Somehow I either forgot that this was needed or assumed it was included or could be easily generated, but the final result was I didn't have them. So I needed three things ultimately from a second annotation application. One, quickly create annotations on the image. Two, generate output that was compatible with VIA import because of the downstream process already developed. And three, generate ground truth images. I installed program after program. I even reached out to a couple of the paid programs for student discounts which they graciously gave me for, for free for a period. I installed Docker and got to learn and debug issues with that. Many programs I tested had additional add-ons you had to install to even get close to what I needed. I even tried a couple of times to pragmatically make a solution that I could use with one of these programs, but it was not happening. I was going down an entirely separate rabbit hole that should have been its own capstone project. It took me about two to three weeks of learning, testing, and debugging of various solutions to get my annotation requirements. Ultimately, I was able to find my software. 
though I still had to write code for some things related. But the big takeaway was that there is not one standard definition of what annotation is. And many of the different outputs from various annotation software products are not compatible with each other at all. So if there are downstream processes that have any sort of dependency, you really need to make sure that you account for that. Now, almost eight weeks into my project, I was still only in the data prep cleaning phase and my clock was running out. With the new software, I was able to take my 45 minute per image to about five to eight minutes per image. And it made the annotations and ground truth images that I needed. Given the time spent on all these activities, my buffer for my project was greatly reduced, as was my data set. At some point, I realized I needed to move on to the next phase with what I had and then circle back if needed. I still had not created the contour images or tested these images in my networks. What was the final number of the base set of annotated images? 114. It seemed small, but I had worked on other non-computer vision classification projects and in my sleep deprived mind, it wasn't terrible. I was finding it difficult to find the information on what was a good number for a computer vision project. So 114 it was. The software I used made ground truth images that I needed and produced an export of the annotations that was compatible with VIA. So I could then import into VIA and then export my needed JSON files for the contour images I still had to create. The VIA export was pretty essential to creating those contour images. Thankfully, the code I previously created to make the contour images only needed minor tweaks. Finally, something was going right. So I could move on to testing my now cleaned and completed data set with my previously tested neural networks. It's gonna get messy here for a minute. I promise to keep it short and high level because this really isn't a deep dive session into neural networks. I'm not gonna go into all the nitty gritty details of the various networks, but I want to quickly explain a few things. This is the SegNet art architecture I used. You take an image and it's matching ground truth image. And this is what the network uses to learn. It takes those images, gets some important details, makes them smaller, repeats this process, and then makes them larger again to use in its prediction. I used SegNet because it's been around since 2016, 2017. It's stable, light, and only has a few parameters you need to tweak during the process. It's memory efficient and comparatively easy to train. Also, I had already used a similar model, so I wanted to minimize debugging something different. My goal wasn't to find the best networks. It was to see if using a fourth channel made an improvement. So in that respect, using an older neural network met my criteria just fine. This is the edge detection network I use. It is called Holistically Nested Edge Detection, or HED for short. It's even older than SegNet, going all the way back to 2015. Again, I'm not gonna go into the nitty gritty here. You can read the official papers on it, but I'll give you a high level overview. For this network, you need your original image and it's a corresponding contour image. Remember that image that was generated from those pesky JSON annotation files? in that downstream process I kept mentioning? Yeah, this is it. In this instance, the contour image is the network's ground truth image because all it really cares about is the edges. In this network, there are predictions made through each step of the process, five total, and they are fused together for a final prediction. Like the contour image, the predicted image is really just composed of one and zero a one-dimensional array of zero and ones, representing if there's an edge or not. The prediction is the basis of the fourth channel used in the integrated network. And then finally, our integrated network. We take the input image and the edge image, concatenate them together to make our fourth channel image. Then that concatenated fourth channel image is fed through SegNet again with the original ground truth and results in a final prediction. 
already, already done this before and done pre-test at the beginning of their project. So I was pretty confident that all I would have to do is sit back and let the networks run. Problem two, neural networks are not plug and play. Well, let me clarify that. Segnet was not plug and play. I was getting errors all over the place. I wasn't even to the point of testing the HED network or integrated network. I half abandoned Segnet and tried with UNet, another new neural network, but it was giving me similar problems. I had used this setup before with images of a different size. My pretest involved images and ground truth images that were the same size that I had previously used when running a similar project, and they had worked fine. So that was my first clue. One of the biggest changes from my pretest was image size. That's where I started my investigation. For those of you who have coded for a while, most of you are probably aware of the debug tool called Print. I used two images and printed out the changes of the array size as it went through segment. Thank goodness for print. What I failed to mention before when I talked about this network is that when you start with an image shape and then make it smaller and then bigger again, you want the corresponding shapes to match. Each stage that it gets smaller needs to match its corresponding larger size. The image we talked about at the beginning, 360 width by 363 height, yeah, the maths in my segment were not adding up. That 360 by 363 divided going down and then multiplied to go back up didn't come back to 360 by 363, which it needed to. Even when I played with some padding parameters, you can change in segment. So now knowing my image size didn't work, I had to find sizes that did work. There was no instruction manual with these things. Wanting to preserve image detail, I tried first tweaking some parameters. That was a no-go. Then I sat with a calculator and paper to try and see what image sizes would work. After testing different sizes with changes in variables, oddly enough, it was determined that 361 width by 363 height was the ideal image size that would minimize changes to the original image and still process through the network. If I made it too much bigger, I could have fundamentally changed the image. Also, our images were already kind of small. So if I made the image much smaller, I could lose valuable information or cause other unintended consequences. So a helper Python file was created to copy the pixels along one edge, resulting in the new desired size. This made the images run smoothly through and resulted in no information lost to the images. What it also meant was that I had to apply this to all the images, all ground truth images, rerun the annotation process, and then recreate the contour images. It's not a super lengthy process, but just remembering what does this affect? And if you forget something, you find out with more obtuse error messages later on when you run it again. Once this was all resolved, I thought, finally, but my network still wasn't happy. It was giving me some problems with channel size. Not my great edge fourth channel, because we haven't even gotten there yet, but a different channel. Turns out it meant a completely different thing. You see, not all ground truth images are the same either. First off, ground truth images are not all the same format. PNG and TIFF are frequent formats because they allow for transparency, but the underlying arrays can also be different. The ground truth images that had been created by the annotation software I used produced an image with the shape of 363, 360, four. Four instead of three because of the transparency layer. One of my error messages actually had value and said something along the lines of expecting five channels and received 254. Hmm, five channels, similar to how many colors are here. I pulled the image into Visual Studio so I could use Python and look at the underlying array. 360, 363, four. Was it having a problem with the transparency layer? 
Yes, but there was more. Hmm. I pulled in one of the ground truth images and re that, that I ran in my pretest into Visual Studio and I saw something interesting. Going back to our five by five image example, instead of that image shape 553, or in our case with the transparency layer 554, what I saw with the already tested images that worked was an edge shape or was an image shape of 55 or 551. And this reminded me of when I was trying to look at the MATLAB ground truth images that I had created during my annotation software exploration. And I remembered realizing that the numbers represented in the 55 shape, like the twos in the bottom box here, instead of equaling a combination of colors, it was representing an actual class it belonged to. So I went back and verified that every combination of numbers with a shape that had this third axis translated into a specific class. It did. So I wondered out loud, can I just flatten this out? Change the shape and replace with a class number for each combination of colors? Turns out, the answer is yes. By flattening the three blocks you see at the top to the one block you see at the bottom, the array has a singular number representing each block in the three by three square. In this process, the square's number is set to have a class label of two and the shape of the array changes to the needed five by five. This is what my network was looking for. By flattening my ground truth images, to the shape 363, 361, a singular value was given to denote the class of each object with one of the 11 class labels I was using. Note, this is not the same as the contour image we were talking about earlier. I'm changing this top row that has the last axis as a three that we call channels to a one channel that you see at the bottom. And this was because my project needed the ground truth images to have the lower shape instead of the one at the top. New lesson learned for problem three, know the requirements of your ground truth images for your project. By the way, if you ever have to do this for a computer vision project, which wouldn't be surprising, if you try to open your newly saved image up in traditional image software, that one you just flattened out, your image may end up looking something like this. Don't panic. Regular image viewers really want to look at it like it's a color. And that black value of zero is just too close to our class numbers one through 11. If you want to see what it looks like, then pull it into MATLAB or Python using a MATLAB library or some similar project. Then it will go back to looking like you expected. Maybe not the exact colors you expected, but different colors for different channels. The colors are really just for benefit for your human eye. And finally, we could run our images through our networks and get some results. Before we get into the results, I want to step back now and talk about those splits from the beginning. Recall we had 114 images. We also need to split those into different sets. Looking at those original splits and accounting for decimals. This is really what the splits broke down to. And if you're fast at math, you probably already noticed that line one isn't exactly right, but the decimals in the situation made the splits a little wonky, so I kept the split as close as I could. Now, not every image has every object class. In fact, most images have four to five classes in it, which is why you would see about four to five colors in the ground truth images. All of them had some of the classes, background and the two classes for red blood cells. Sometimes they even had some of those tiny platelets. And then usually one of the other seven classes listed as two through eight here. So really those numbers for splits started to look abysmal. In fact, that really meant some classes may be represented in only one or two images in, that, in these splits. That certainly wouldn't be enough to train on and not much better with it being on your tester validation side. But let's hold that thought for just a minute. 
what I realized right away that from a training perspective, 60, 20, 20 was not going to be helpful. Just too low of a number to even consider for training sets. Each split, split I used had to be run through each network, which is time consuming. I hadn't tested everything end to end with evaluation me evaluating metrics. So using reasonable ju judgment to cut one of these, it just made it easier for me. There was no, no sense with that low of a number to do the 60, 20, 20. And these were my initial results. Very unexpected. My loss wasn't bad and my accuracy was nothing to sneeze at. Accuracy is in the mid 80%. Accuracy as used here, let me know how often my model's prediction for a pixel was right. Loss just helps you to understand how much the predicted value differ from the actual value. If the model's prediction is perfect, then the loss is zero. Otherwise, the loss is greater. It's not like accuracy where you would cap out at 100%, so your loss can actually exceed one or even way more. If you look at the comparison of splits here, my loss numbers were a little higher on my 70-15-15 split, so that meant there's a little bit more error there. Looking at this first run of results, I thought, wow, I'm amazing. I finally got this so under control. This may be a good time to throw out one of my favorite quotes in here. If you are not prepared to be wrong, you will never come up with anything original. And boy, was I wrong. What happened is that my classes were unbalanced. If you look at this ground truth image, what do you see most of? Black, background. So my model got really good at learning and identifying background, which was a big part of this image. What else do you see? A lot of orange and red, which represents single RBCs and RBCs that overlapped or are off to the edge of the image. We also see some tiny platelets and then one large basos, basophil blood cell, which by the way, as we said, was only in a small number of the images. Background and RBCs are in every image, but not the other classes. So our model had fewer chances of learning the other classes, but got really, really good at learning the things that dominated each image and were in every image. Using accuracy as my metric wasn't going to work here. It was right 85% of the time because look at how much of this image it could learn from each time. So I had to make a different, so I had to find a different metric. Using another metric called intersection over union, IOU, I was able to get a better picture of what was going on. It is an evaluation metric used to measure the accuracy of an object detector on a particular data set. With IOU, you use the ground truth mass and the prediction mass. You then see how close those two masks overlap, aka intersect. If the masks overlap exactly, then they are the same as the union of the mask. So when divided, the IOU equals what? Perfect. If they don't have overlap at all, then in this formula, the IOU equals zero, no match. Usually you have something in between. By using this metric, I could get a better idea of how each class fared. With this slide, I'm showing you what the correct metric for my project was, and you don't need to memorize this specific metric. Um, it is helpful for computer vision, but the big takeaway is that you need to make sure you are using the right metric for your project. And that's not exclusive to computer vision. Those of you in analytics have probably dealt with this before and are quite familiar with it. Here's the breakdown of classes using IOU. Although again, not the same as accuracy, you can see how they have a strong influence on that original accuracy metric. By the way, the platelets here have had small examples like you see here, but also larger examples in other images. So that's why you see kind of a middle of the road metric here for platelets. And this is the initial results with the two different splits. With our remaining classes, arguably the most important ones, we can see how dismal our predictions are. Even when you compare the different model splits, I don't think I have ever seen metric results so low. So what to do? 
I had three weeks left to finish my project, write a paper, and then afterwards have one week to make it all a nice presentation for the capstone committee. Go big or go home. With no experience creating a synthetic data set, I decided this would save me from all things horrible in my mind. Never mind, I probably could have closed the project project with a simple, well, here's what I learned. I really, really wanted to see something with more meaning in my results because the numbers I had so far were pretty meaningless and arguably could have changed dramatically when done in multiple runs. What I did know was that synthetic data sets, data sets that use real objects from other images to create new ones, showed a lot of promise in the field of computer vision. Fortunately, the rabbit hole for this one wasn't too bad. I stumbled on a website from Immersion, Immersive Limit that led me to the author's GitHub page. I sprung for the few extra bucks for the corresponding tutorial on Udemy. I highly recommend it, by the way, if you're ever faced with having to create a synthetic data set on the fly. It's amazing. I have it at the end of my slides, the link for it. And an additional bonus for this was that the author's co-generated ground truth images and annotations. So I was all in. Now, I did run into some issues because of course his project wasn't exactly like mine. He used instant segmentation. And if you recall, I use semantic, but the short of it was after one to two weeks of flipping between that and working on my paper, I was able to generate all that I needed. By combining it with my base set, I ran with a more balanced representation than I had previously used. Although I used zero RBCs in the synthetic set because of their density in my base set. I created 1800 images and combined them with my original base set of 114. 1800 was chosen because it was similar to the density of the RBCs, but because you also have to do some time consuming masks of images that your synthetic data set generation process will use to create the new data set. It will randomly choose those individual image masks from a pool, make some changes to them, and then randomly place them on a background. The images that you see here are some of the actual images that were created in the generation process. Pretty cool. You would probably never have a lab slide of cells that look like these combinations but it turns out that computer vision doesn't really care. It's just learning what those different objects can look like in different scenarios. You don't need fancy software to create this, just GIMP and a Python IDE like Visual Studio. So after that was done, the entire process was run again. While not ideal results, this was looking much better. And remember that our main goal was not to have the highest metrics as possible. Our goal was to see if there was a notable difference when you added a fourth channel, good or bad. So while the results were still pretty low in some cases, what we do see is that there is significant movement with adding the fourth channel, especially for some reason with neutrophil. And looking at our drastic drop in RBC classes, we have also learned a final lesson and that class balance makes a difference within the individual images, as well as how it is placed across an entire set. So if you look at the IOU meme here, um, it's, it's written as IOUM, and even better yet, the adjusted meme, which throws out the bad RBC classes, you can get a better idea of that change between the networks. One of my final recommendations for this project was to increase the synthetic set by way more which could be done reasonably with a couple of weeks on the side. That wouldn't make my timeline, but I had my answer that I could present and finalize in my very large paper. So problem one, know what you need with your annotations and know what you are getting. This includes knowing if there are any downstream process dependencies. Problem two, not all neural networks are plug and play. There is a big dependency on the actual images and you need to know what those are in advance. Maybe it's size, maybe it's something specific with the ground truth images, maybe it's something else. But knowing what those things may be can save you a lot of headaches. Problem three, not all ground truth images are the same. 
This ties into problem two, but take a moment to pull your ground truth images into Python and see what's under the covers. One, it's actually kind of cool. But two, it gives you an idea of the shape and really thinking in the space of how that shape applies to the images. Problem four, data splits. Choose the right data split for how many images you have. This really may, this really may be better tied, titled as, make sure you have enough data. Computer vision needs a lot of data. There's not a specific number, but I can tell you for sure that 114 is not the right number. Ideally, you want to have over tens of thousands. But again, that really depends on what you're doing. Problem five, and I found this holds true for a lot of machine learning tasks. Make sure you choose the right metric. If you are not sure, try different ones out and do some background research on what the best metric is for the task you are doing. Some fun stuff now. Here's an example of a real image prediction between the base network and the one with the fourth channel. Um, they're pretty similar with the prediction on everything else. And the goal is to look as close to the ground truth, which is in the center here, um, as possible. I think that center blood cell is a basophil. And you can see where it has more purple leanings in the integrated network and a little stronger on the small platelets for the images with the fourth channel, this one. So something funny here, I noticed when doing my paper, if you notice the ground truth image has this RBC as peach and both predictions have it as cream. That ground truth is actually labeled raw. It's just hitting that edge just barely, barely touching that edge. And I should have labeled it, because I was the labeler, as RBCOL, which is cream in color. And the models caught it. One of the often cited benefits of neural networks is that when a human labels things, they may make mistakes because of fatigue or other issues. With a neural network, you don't really have that. And this was kind of a live example of that for me. Lastly, and mostly because I just thought this was super cool, here's a comparison of how the networks learned on different iterations, which is called an epoch. At the beginning, the segnet learning is super fuzzy um, compared to the integrated network. So here we see it's really fuzzy and it's really clean here. Um, and we have some uh, pretty immediate identification of some objects here. But then later, the integrated network, at least for some of this image, um, seems to have some issues in some places, though the tiny platelets are a little bit better. So putting this pre presentation together reignited my desire to go back and explore this a little bit more and clean everything up for GitHub. I, I want to create the uh, way more synthetic images. And hopefully, um, for those of you that are interested, I'll have all of that with the new results um, updated on GitHub soon if you're interested. One of the biggest things I learned in my AI journey is that most projects are not groundbreaking successes, especially at a first or second go at a project. Whether that is school or work or obsessive hobby, um, COVID people, you know who you are. Everyone wants to be on the cutting edge, but don't let you, that make you miss the most important lesson. Does your project provide you with valuable information? Because that is really what the ultimate goal is. Here are the resources mentioned in my presentation. My paper is also available in GitHub if you're interested in all the details. Um, and I think we, we have some time now if anybody has any questions. All right. Christina, great presentation there. Really like it. Uh, how can I say? Uh, an education there in terms of challenges that may arise when pursuing computer vision. You know, from a very interesting, I would say that uh, the key parts for me at least was when uh, you realized that 
the background was the one that was driving the high accuracy level that is very important but that would have derailed your uh, proposal per se, uh, in itself because that's the root of identifying that hey it's the background and not the image that i'm looking at let's change that yeah, i think in a lot of analytic projects you know we think of class balance but it's it's a little bit harder to visualize it in computer vision of what that really means right so you may think of it in, oh, I have this many here of these images. And, and you, it's, it's a little bit harder, I think, to conceptualize what that balance looks like within an image than it is, you know, for, oh, I have, you know, this set of data and it's all female and all, you know, it's this percentage of female and this percentage of male or this age group and this age group and this age group. That, that's a little bit more obvious, I think, sometimes than, than computer vision images. Exactly, and preferably to be able to, uh, because as you said, it, you know, the data itself is not like, hey, I can go there and do a select and look at it and yeah. do different <laughs> ways to to prove whether my theory holds holds water or not. You know, and I because... actually did have a breakdown of the objects, um, and for those that are interested, it is in my paper. Um, so for me. Uh, I could clearly see how much that was unbalanced, and it really, really was. But it it wasn't till that aha moment when I saw those that using the right metric that I was like, oh wow, what what this really means. <laughs> it was very interesting. I saw that. Uh, I think there was, as you said, you know, the moment to go and realize and understanding the creation of synthetic image the image or data set you mentioned that that was like oh and uh the challenge of using and you know and playing with the different types of software from uh dockers to many other probably libraries i don't know but i believe you probably use several libraries too to test and none of them quite like met what I needed, but yeah. Uh, an interesting side note that I didn't mention was if I had just if I had just created synthetic from the beginning, which I think would have worked fine for this project instead of a combination, I would have bypassed all that pain. So because the um, the uh, the synthetic data set created a lot of that. It created that annotation for me within that file. Um, it created those ground truth images. I still did have to use my previous process where I flattened it out. Um, but all of those pain points, it just kind of took that away and I could instantly just pull it into VIA very easily and all that was gone. So that was nice. Yeah, but you know that, how can I say, as you said, the. Uh... The pain points are the ones that bring in and drive all that learning that you went through. You know, discover it, better said. Yeah. And uh, I'm just looking to see if we have any questions here so far. No. <clears throat> so, folks, we'll give you uh, another minute here as we continue to talk about this. And uh, enter your question. If you have... Uh, at the live chat. Now, if you're watching us after the live stream, use the comment section. A lot of great information. So if you have already seen it, re-watch it, take step by step, reference the resources here where Christina has placed it on the her GitHub. So she's sharing her, some of the information there, along with the data set. And the uh, questions later, again, at the beginning slide, I think I have my LinkedIn contact. So feel free to reach out and ask questions. I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, very well. So just uh, one more minute here. And uh, folks, just also hang on tight a little bit after. So we will bring this presentation here to a conclusion, but stay on the channel, on the, on the stream as... Uh, we will do the drawing for the Power BI Fest as well. Uh, 
and that will be right after the of in you know at the end of of this uh, stream here so we will be doing the power bi fest all right uh so folks you got a couple minutes there go ahead and enter that any questions you may have there <laughs> And uh, also what I think was interesting as well is, uh, you know, you keeping in mind, I always remember yourself about the, the goal of finding whether or not the value of that fourth uh, duration there for the process. So that's very key. Yeah, I mean, it just based on 1800 images, which still wasn't enough, but it did show me that there's some movement. That's why it's reignited, even though it's been a few months since I've uh, done it, that, oh, I should, you know, this presentation, maybe go back and go, you know what, now is the time for me to, to do that painful making of masks and stuff so I can create more synthetic images and, and go back and see how that would work with, you know, say 10,000, 20,000 images uh, and, and see where that kind of, uh, really lays this out because I, we did see so much movement between some of those percentages. And overall, I think, uh, you know, the average was when we, we look at uh, the bottom numbers, the means, uh, we had, you know, eight to 10% difference when you added that fourth channel. And that's really interesting information. Um, and that can be applied regardless uh, of the uh... I'm sorry, I missed your last part. That uh... so that can be so that can be applied to any neural network. It's it's irrespective of whether I'm you're using Segnet or Unit or or any of those because it's really showing just that the adding of that edge creates an improvement no matter what neural network you 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 may be using. So interesting thing. That a lot of people, if they want to do it, the, the data set is actually a publicly available data set that they can kind of take it in many, many different directions to play with. Awesome. So there it is, folks. Some uh, great information. If you're out there, whether you are doing data, AI, and any projects involve computer vision, that uh, information that uh, Christina is sharing here is true, provides re, uh, true value on your journey here, you know, and uh, anything else there, Christina? All right, so with that, I'm going to, we are going to transition here from the Microsoft Data AI and the uh, we have the Power BI Fest, which is a separate event uh, related to Power BI. I know nothing to do with this. It's just that uh, we have a raffle, and uh, uh, I'm also an organizer on that event. And by sh doing the raffle live, you know, everybody can see it firsthand, the results and what is uh, it all involves. And, uh, you know, announcing the winners here as we do the drawing live as well. It's a Saturday, that, right? Correct. Correct. So it's going to be, and let me share this for a minute. Uh, let me trend this here. And uh, just a second. I will be sharing. All right, so <clears throat> the website is powerbifest.com and as Christina outlined, it will be this Saturday, November 20th, 2021, to be more exact, actually, and that's a great point you brought it up. So let's take a look at the, uh, if we look at event schedule here, 
on the event schedule event. On the event schedule, it actually depending where you are in the world. So here my time is New York. So we are actually starting here on Friday, the 19th at 5 p.m. Yeah, that's because what we are looking here is based on Helsinki. So Helsinki is at midnight. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we'll, because this will be a full day presentation. Will be, and uh, all the way down to, boom, midnight, at 11.50 p.m. of November 20. And uh, if anybody out there who is involved with uh, Power BI, this is definitely an event to watch and see. Now, as you go here, uh, Power BI Fest event desk schedule, you will see the different time frame. So it will be the Helsinki, which it drives the, uh, the scheduling and everything. But you can see what does it represent to your own local time. So in your local time is telling me here it starts on Friday, the 19th. All right. Uh, one second. Did it change? Yeah, it is going through. I'm just making sure it, I can see it over there. So, folks, uh, and uh, who will be presenting? Uh, we are very happy to say we are, we are blessed to say that when you look, we divide it into three different regions. What we are talking about, we start on the APOC, which is Asia Pacific, with uh, Leila Etati, Reza Rad, Matt. Arlington, Alice Drummond, Phil C. Mark, those are well-known names and many others here from that region. And as we go along through the day here, you will see, uh, we will get to uh, the other part, which is called EMEA, which is, you know, is uh, Europe, Middle East, Africa, and you see some great names from there as well, uh, including uh, Imke, Andy Cutler, Laura, Alexander Avison. Uh, you will see also uh, Gloria from Nigeria, David Abu, and uh, some other names that people are quite familiar with, and as well as uh, most of them. Then we will go to Americas, where you also see several of them. I believe some of people may know uh, from Shannon Lindsay, uh, as well as Marco Russo and uh, Alberto Ferrari, and many great people out there. You know, it's so we have uh, over uh, 100 sessions. So. That's why I can, you know, being able to make 24 hours with, uh, at times on six tracks, you know, quite busy day. Really great lineup. Yes, yes, very, we are very blessed. Now, we also have the raffle, as I said. So folks, uh, if you go to Pound Power BI Fest, whether it is on LinkedIn and or Twitter, and or if you come to the website, the powerbifest.com website, you'll be able to enter to win a raffle. And uh, on the raffle, we will have uh, several prizes. Let me just clear it out here. And uh, so those prizes are, we have uh, books and we have uh, cash prizes and all i'm doing here is just cleaning out what makes and so the winners will be 
cannot be the same person that was before. And uh, so the idea is to try to give everyone uh, an opportunity to win here as well a prize without the... Uh, so let, I have to change the window here to... Sh or actually I can leave this here. Bring the wheel, I will... So be using the these websites, everybody can see the wheel of names where we are going to be putting everyone's name that uh, are here. So let us download. So give me just a second to open the file here and get the names on the wheel of names where we are going to load and start the drawing. Now, if you were a winner yesterday when we had carried out the other, so you won't be eligible to win again, as I just said. So give me two seconds here, let me get it. And uh, just making sure that There are no duplicate names here. But also, you can only enter your name in one. Once. All right, let's do a shuffle. And another shuffle. And uh, one more thing we need to do. A great is, idea. I love this. Yeah, this I like the setup too, you know. And one more thing we have to do is just to remove those who won last time. So actually, I should. Uh, it would be easier for me to find if I did this. So he won yesterday. And uh, and uh, so won. And uh, also one. Yeah, and this is pretty cool, but also provides us, you know, we want to sort to do this kind of search to remove uh, some uh, people have already won. That's it. Because we have, uh, we're going to spin one, two, three, four, five, six times. Because we have, uh, so thanks to our sponsors. All right, a couple of shuffles. Boom. So thanks to our sponsor, Info, Info River as well as uh, pack books we are here we'll have uh, a few books we have the expert data modeling with power bi from bachi 
we will have the we will have the Power Query cookbook. So we will be one of each of those books. Then we have, uh, and all of these books are pretty new. They are uh, nine. They are like second half of the year uh, Power BI related books. And we also have the Extending Power BI with Python and R book. This book is about to be published. So we are trying to bring like the latest and greatest as far as Power BI books that we are raffling here. And the, the Info River, who is also a sponsor, will be give, uh, giving here uh, two $25 gift cards. All right, and the order we are gonna do folks will be the Expert Data Modeling with Power BI book the extending Power BI with Python and R book. Then will be a gift card. Then the Power Query cookbook. Then the extending Power BI with Python and R book. And finally, at the end, another $25 gift card from InfoRiver. With that in mind, folks, let's get started. <clears throat> and uh, by the way, if in the future you want to do a uh, to register for the raffle, remember Power BI Fest, and uh, you can go out there and uh, register. This can be a say raffle, and there we go. You can register here for the raffle. As you can see, our sponsors, and uh, the list of prices I explained it right. The prices I explained it right here. So you see the two gift cards, just as. I outlined a link if you all want to learn a bit more about each item, each of the books, some great titles out there for you to further your Power BI learning. All right, now without further ado, <clears throat> let's uh, get started. We're going to spin for the expert data modeling with a Power BI book. And uh, click to spin. So let's see the first here, the winner is. All right. Rolly Valenzuela is the winner for the expert data modeling with Power BI book. I'm gonna remove your name and second. Now he's going to extending Power BI with Python and R. Janice Soa. Congratulations, Janice. And uh, let's go for the next one. And uh, spinning for the InfoRiver $25 gift card. And Mr. Sri. Congratulations there. Winner for the $25 Info River gift card. And next we have the Power Query cookbook. All right, we have uh, Amal. Congratulations, there, Amal. You got the Power Query cookbook. Next, we have the Extending Power BI with Python and R. Antonio, congratulations, there, Antonio. All winning the book. And finally, we have the $25, another $25 gift card from InfoRiver. And the winner is Mariana. Congratulations there, Mariana. So for the winners, I will be sharing information with the respective sponsors. Meaning books 
from packet and uh, the gift card comes from in forever so remember check out our sponsors in forever.com and the uh, packetpub.com check out their products a pretty interesting product by the way from each of them and uh, you still have a chance to win actually you have uh, I believe it's two more chances to win, two or three more chances to win by attending the Power BI Fest. So remember to register. Just go to the powerbifest.com, click on the register button, fill out the registration. As I said, the schedule, if you are on East Standard Time, it starts on 5 p.m. on Friday, November 29. If you are anywhere that is uh, east of Helsinki, Finland, it's already the 20th for you. So if you're out there in New Zealand, Australia, if I'm not mistaken, in Canberra time zone, it starts, I believe, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. So folks, register. Amazing presentations, as you can see, some phenomenal presenters. All presenters are top quality. They represent more than 25 different countries, delivering over 100, uh, more than 125 different uh, sessions and uh, just around 100 different uh, presenters. So if you're out there, you want to learn about Power BI and Power BI integration with Power Platform, where there is uh, Power Apps and other technologies, as well as AI and ML, you come to the right place, Power BI Fest, check it out, and I bid you all farewell. Do you have any final words here, Christina? I'm really excited. I'm about the Power BI Fest this weekend. I'm, I'm glad you pointed out that it starts on Friday because um, I had just rushed to register for it and then you know, got distracted with something else and hadn't had a chance to kind of dig down into it. So uh, I'll be looking at that starting at five o'clock on Friday. Outstanding. So it's a great point. I will also make a, a point of, uh, you know, outlining the, the schedule where it starts for us who lives on the west side of Helsinki <laughs> for, <laughs> you know, when it starts. And uh, can you just hang on a second here as we finish this? And I'd uh, like just to talk to you for a minute after the presentation. And uh, everyone else, thank you very much. Have a good night and uh, stay tuned for our next presentation at the Microsoft Data and AI South Florida. Thank you very much, Christina, for being here, sharing some great knowledge. Yeah. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>